We have a guest speaker this morning that's no stranger to this community and especially on top of the mountain. Randy Cosner and Christy are here with us today to share a message. We've asked him to just come and be a guest speaker. Um, Randy has many years in the valley, over 30, I guess, at Briar Branch. 26, I'm sorry. But anyway, Randy also had a, a time of service, if I'm remembering correctly, in this district, preaching at Danville Church for several years. Actually, our moderator um, came to the altar and gave her heart to the Lord after a message from Randy Costner. That's Sherry Zyler. And she remembers that distinctly. And I could go on and on. Randy's worked in the coal mines. He has worked in many different trade areas. And it's just a real blessing, brother, to have you with us. And I'm going to give this over to you now. They came to hear you today. <laughs> well, what <clears throat> happiness it is for me to be with you today. Thank you, uh, Grover, for... Uh, offering this Sunday to come and I'm glad I was able to work it out. I asked a young man from our own church at Briary Branch to fill the pulpit this morning. I have been working on him for a number of years and I believe that he can and may uh, hear the call someday to go forward into the pastoral ministry. And I'm still praying that he might feel the call to do that. And we have called out um, two persons from Bribery Branch Church who are now uh, pastoring. Well, the one lady is assistant pastor to us at Bribery Branch. Her husband just passed away two days ago and very sad. And but a young another young man I walked up to one day, and you know the Lord just works beyond anything we can imagine or ask or think. So who would even think that you could walk up to a young man twenty years younger than me, and say to him, "Have you ever thought about possibly that you could go into ministry?" And I think he was pretty surprised, and. He didn't give me an answer right then, but within a couple of weeks, he'd come back to me and said, you know, I have thought about that. And he took what was then the three-year reading course in Shenandoah District. Incidentally, it's four-year reading course now, but then it was three years, and he took that, and he is now pastoring the Moscow Church of the Brethren within probably about 10 or 12 miles from us. And I told him that was just fine, just don't take any people from our church. <laughs> and no, he's doing a wonderful job. It's good to be with you here today at Oakdale. My wife Christy's with me and my mother-in-law Glendora Woods. Also see some familiar faces. Uh, Marsha and Amy, good to see you. Also see Pam Nash back there. Fond memories of Pam going on a disaster trip. That was just last summer, wasn't it? All year before. Okay, see, years go by. She come to my house, and we needed to go to the district office. And so she and I got in my old pickup. And what do you know? It quit on us before we got to the district office. <laughs> we had to call my wife to come after me and Pam and pick us up, take us to the the district and we had a great week in North and South Carolina. I didn't get to work with Pam, they, they separated us, but we worked in different projects and I don't know if you've all had any experience in disaster service, but it once you do it, you'll probably do it every year after that. Uh, I had a, an older lady in our congregation who was heavily involved in district disaster services, which is basically works with the national disaster service. And she always told me year after year, Randy, 
you need to go on disaster service work. And I usually said, I'll get to it. We'll do it one of these days. And so one year I went. And I believe I've gone almost every year now for 20 years. And we went five times to New Orleans in five different years. And I just enjoyed that tremendously. Worked on a lot of people's houses. And yes, I am from uh, Mount Storm. I didn't know there was a civilized place to live until I moved off the mountain. And what do you know, I found out that there are places where the weather's better. And so I uh, moved off the mountain when my wife and I were married. We lived over on the Knobbly Road for about 15 years or so, probably. And <clears throat> I felt the call to the ministry early in my life, but I didn't know how to do it. I guess I, I was working at the mines, Allegheny Mining on the top of the mountain. And I had a, a preacher in Mount Storm tell me, you know, he felt like God was calling me to ministry. <laughs> And I used to think, well, uh, how do you do that? Do I just quit my job and go be a preacher somewhere? I didn't know how to do that. And so one day I told my wife, I said, you know, if God wants me to be a preacher, he'll have to take that job at the mines away from me because I will never be able to quit it to go in the ministry. You see, people, pastors, have the same struggles as anybody else. So I felt the call, but I didn't have the faith to leave the job. You know, I'm working, making good money, I guess you'd say, and I just told her I, I won't be able to do it. Well, it was a couple of years later, I got laid off. God took the job away. Now, I was pretty upset at God for doing that. And I was living in West Virginia in, in, in 83, got laid off. And if anybody remembers 81, 82, 83, there wasn't a job to, fi to find anywhere. Unemployment probably in West Virginia was 15, 16%. I couldn't find a job anywhere. I was milking cows for a living for a while. Glad to do it. But then um, I began filling in some pulpit time for churches, much like today, and did that a couple times for the Danville Church of the Brethren. And after preaching on Mother's Day and then preaching on Father's Day, in July, they wrote me a letter and said, how about being our pastor? I was surprised. But we <clears throat> became pastor of Danville, and I was there for eight years, and I have very fond memories of Sherry Zyler, her wife, uh, her uh, husband, I mean, <laughs> and her children, and, and many others, most of which have passed away. Uh, since I was there. But then we did feel that perhaps the Lord would use me in full-time ministry. Now that was a pretty big step. I was working a job and but decided I would be available if the Lord wanted to use me for full-time ministry. So we filled out the profile and sent it away and <clears throat> got a got a few profiles, church profiles from Shenandoah District. One church in which gave me a call and I went for interview with them and the meetings went great and all. And I'm thinking, okay, they're going to call me to be pastor of their church. So I went to that church on a specific Sunday gave what was called a trial sermon at that time. And you know what? I didn't, did not get the vote. 
So I could not accept being pastor there. That church was in Stanley, Virginia. And so I cried all the way home. And I thought at that time, okay, Lord, I get that message. You don't want me to be a pastor. Because, you know, most pastors never get rejected at all in their life. And I got rejected the first time. So, so I went for a few months just in limbo thinking that's, this is not going to happen. And so finally I gave the district executive in Shenandoah District a call. And I said, do you have any churches in Shenandoah District that's seeking a pastor right now? And if you do, uh, I would like if you would send profiles to me. And he sent me 10 profiles of churches. I mean, you know, a stack an inch high of profiles. And I'm leafing through these profiles looking at what church do I think would want me to be a pastor. So I'd read down over this one and I'd say, well, they sure wouldn't want me. And I th tossed that one aside. Looked over the next one. They wouldn't want me, I'm sure. Tossed that one aside. Looked over the next one. Well, this looks like pretty good profile. I, I like the looks of this. But it says seminary graduate preferred. <laughs> well, I said, they wouldn't want me. Throw Datton off the side. Datton was the Briary Branch Church of the Brethren. About a week after going through all the profiles and pretty much deciding, none of those churches would likely want me. About a week later, I got a call from the search committee chairman of Briary Branch Church of the Brethren. And he said, would you uh, like to talk to us uh, about possibly being pastor? Well, it took me about two seconds, and I said, yes. But still, I still remember that profile. They said they wanted a seminary graduate. I tell you, I'm lucky to be a grade school graduate. And I didn't have Bible college. I had no seminary degree. had nothing. So while we joyfully traveled to Briary Branch, a community I'd never heard of before, and even thought they had kind of a weird name, they never even brought up the seminary graduate in the interview process. And I didn't bring it up either. But anyway, you know the story. Went through it all perfectly. Went through the uh, trial sermon. Received 98% of the vote. And the three people that voted against me apologized later. And we've been there for 26 years and it's been one of the most uh, joyful experiences that we've could have imagined. I would have never thought that we could be there that long. And But God's blessing has been good. Okay, today I want to share with you a sermon that <clears throat> I would title Broken Shells. And I just happen to have some seashells with me. But these sheet seashells are not broken. They're almost perfect. I brought back 30 or 40 pounds of them. You know, I'm a West Virginia fellow. I've never seen seashells too often. With the exception of this one, this one's a weirdo. It doesn't have any real form at, at all but all of these others and there's eight of them here are just nearly perfect with oh they might have a tiny chip out of them and just to do it I'm going to these two are probably the most perfect ones that I could find and so just to do it I'd like to pass seashell around for you to look at real closely. It's just how perfect this seashell is. And I know maybe it's 
not a big thing, but to just think that that seashell was somewhere in the ocean and it washed off on uh, up into the beach around Corona, which is the, in the northern part of the Outer Banks. It's north of Kill Devil Hills. It's even north of Duck. It's up there where uh, there's not quite as big crowds as there are in other places. Now, the thing about finding a seashell like the one you're going to look at is that they're not as easy to find as you might think. The shoreline is filled up with just fragments of broken shells. And you could even see a shell that would have been just perfect, but it's got half of it broke off. And so as you're walking along, and I probably walked for half a mile in both directions from where we were, you just see these piles of, of broken up shells. And of course, I'm looking for the perfect one. And so as I'm walking along, my eye will catch one. Hmm. That one looks perfect. But that didn't happen as often as you might think. I mean, you could walk a half a mile and maybe only find a half dozen uh, perfect shells. And so I began walking by so many shells, I almost felt guilty. You know, I won't pick up the broken shells because I don't care about them. Oh, I want the perfect ones. Get out of here, all you broken ones. I don't want to see you. I'm looking for the one that's not cracked. The one that don't have any, any chips along the, the front. That's, that's the most important part to me. I don't want to see that perfect uh, chip there. Right there is just a almost completely perfect chip or, or shell. No chips. I'll bet my eye caught that and said, oh boy, there's a good one. Might have been covered up with broken pieces, but I don't want them. I get them out of the way. Give me a perfect one. Broken shells. What about them? Well, if you have your Bible and you'd like to turn with me to um, Matthew chapter 12, <clears throat> and I'd like to read uh, from 14, verse 14, down to verse 21. And this is, is a short passage of Scripture where Jesus basically declares himself to be a servant. And so I include verse 14 just for a little context. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Now you want to keep in mind as you're reading the New Testament, the Gospels especially, that all through what you're reading, in the background you've got these groups of Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees are always fair, you see. The Sadducees are always sad, you see. But, uh, you know, they're after Jesus. So now in verse 15, when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and a great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Now that's one of the few places in Scripture. I'm bad about stopping in the middle of reading. That's one of the few places in the New Testament where you'll ever see that Jesus healed them all. In most of the other places, if not all, he healed one or two where he was, but it doesn't say anything about him healing them all. So I've always thought, hey, there's a lot of people there that he, he did not heal. But in this case, Matthew states that he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying. See, Jesus had timing. 
and what he did. But here is the prophecy from Isaiah uh, chapter 42, verses 1 to 4. You don't have to turn there because basically this is exactly what it says there. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. Now, this was Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus. Behold, this is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, Gentiles will trust. You know, every time you see the word Gentiles, you know who that is, don't you? That's us. And you see that in the New Testament. I mean, the Old Testament just as well. God always wanted to reach the Gentiles too. He just used the Jews as a way of introducing himself to the earth. Through Abraham. So the Pharisees are in opposition to Jesus. They try to catch him. They try to trap him. They're doing all kinds of things. If the verse is right prior to this, uh, they're trying to catch him for healing on the Sabbath. Just any little thing he does, they, they want to trap him. But Jesus, in all this kind of thing, is still saying, I'm a servant to the people. I will serve. He quotes from Isaiah 42. Uh, Jesus basically is, is saying this. I know this is probably not in red in your Bible as a, the words of Jesus, but basically Jesus is pointing to Isaiah 42 and is declaring this about himself this scripture that Isaiah wrote, what, 1,000, 1,500 years before, maybe? 1,200 years? Jesus is declared a servant by Isaiah, and Jesus confirms that. I am a servant. You know, that's the same thing that Jesus is telling us today. He's our servant. Some people may look at, at Jesus as some type of dictator, some type of ruthless warrior. I don't know what the secular group out there will bring up next. Satan's got them so overwhelmed that they're liable to do, declare anything. I don't think anything would surprise me anymore. But often, we don't recognize exactly the role that servant Jesus has had in my life. He has not come to condemn me, but he has come that I might be saved and forgiven. He has seen me in my fallen, cracked state. He has seen me when I'm broken and lying on the seashore with all the other broken individuals in humanity. And you know the things that work out in our lives are not accidents. A lot of times I think they are. I think, why did this turn out the way it did? When I was laid off from the mines, I had worked there for more than 10 years. My only job out of high school, I didn't even think about going to college. I went a couple years at Potomac State, but you know, was I going to quit my mining job to go to UVA 
or I mean WVU. Uh, no. Why would I do that? When I got laid off, I had a three-month-old baby, been married three years. I was always uh, head of the household, bringing in the bucks. Now what was I? Now I was a severely depressed 26-year-old man drawing unemployment until it completely ran out. Milk cows for a couple hundred dollars a week for a farmer in our area. But I was severely depressed. I was, you know, crazy things happen to you when you're depressed. And if anyone here uh, is feeling any of that type of thing at all, I urge you not to uh, belittle it. Uh, depression, anxiety is a very serious thing. And it can kill you. Anxiety is the worst. You know the worst thing about having anxiety? It's the anxiety about having anxiety. Anxiety will kill a person. But you know, when we're in situations like that and we think it's hopeless, I, I mean, when I lost my job, for some reason I thought, goodness, I'm going to end up in Virginia. I mean, I thought there's no jobs in West Virginia. I'll have to move to Virginia. And I didn't know anyone in Virginia. I can't do that. You know, as I look back on that right now, I can see that I believe Jesus' hand was in all of that completely. And so, if there are things happening in your life today, now I don't know hardly anyone here personally, but just because you're in church on Sunday morning, that doesn't mean that you couldn't be struggling. And so I want you to know that even if you're in the, what seems to be the pit of something right now, if you don't see any way out, I know that's possible because I've felt that way myself several times. In some respects, I feel that way now. But you know, God's hand is still with us. Even though there are times when we, we cannot see it with our own eyes. I've spent the last three or four months of my life praying for direction as to what God would have me do. Now, if you want to know more about that, you can talk to me after the service. I don't want to talk about it here. But Jesus' hand is all around me. As I sat up in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, reading, praying, you know, this virus thing has is, is given us all lots of more time to probably pray and read and think about things. I still believe Jesus' hand is right there. Even I have to say, I've prayed a few times, why is it taking you so long to give me the answer? until I, I figured out that the reason it's taking so long is part of the answer. Because timing is everything. Amen. When God answers prayer. He don't always just... God is not a vending machine. He don't always just respond exactly the way we think. And I'm pretty much glad he don't. Because some of my prayers have been off the wall. And it's a good thing he didn't answer then. Well, Jesus tells how he is a servant to all. Now, I know that the, the, the quote from Isaiah goes from verse 18 all the way down to verse 21 here. 
But I want to focus on just a short portion of this because I don't have time to, 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 to draw out uh, the entire thing. But the portion that I want to focus on is in verse 20 where it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. It's easy to be reading our Bibles, and I encourage you to read Bible every day, a little bit. And I also encourage you not to do this. Now you can do it, and maybe God will lead you in this, but to do this in reading your Bible, to me, is not the best method. And that is to let it fall open somewhere, run your finger around, point to a verse, hmm, let's see what that says. Now, there may be some value in that. One fellow was down, and he did that. His finger came to Judas, went out, and hung himself. He didn't like the sound of that very well. So he let it fall open again, run his finger down, came to the verse, go and do thou likewise. That's just some human way of illustrating the way I would have you read your Bible is to do it in a consistent and expository way what do I mean by that decide that you want to read for instance the gospel of John so the first day or two you read it read from chapter one read about half of it and the next day start back up with chapter uh, halfway through chapter one wherever you quit start again Next couple of days, you're going to be at chapter 2. So read that. The next day or two, you'll be at chapter 3. Now you're going to read about Nicodemus and what Jesus said about being born again. The next day, go for chapter 4, 5. In a little while, you're going to be there with the uh, uh, Samaritan woman. You're going to hear Jesus say, I'm the living water. So now you're focused on being born again. I'm the living water. In a little bit, you'll be focused on I'm the bread of life. You see, you see consistently through scriptures how you'll, you'll really be blessed. Well, here you might be reading past this and, and, and you'll read this, a bruised reed and a smoking flax. Now, we don't, most of us don't have too much contact with reeds. I'll tell you a person that does have contact with reeds, and that is ones that play instruments that require a reed. I didn't know anything about reeds either until my middle son, Joel, and incidentally, I have three adult sons. Uh, my oldest just turned 36. My middle one is um, 32, I believe. My youngest one is 24. Had a little help there. But Joel decided at a pretty young age while in middle school, he was going to learn to play saxophone. So he, we gave him a saxophone, and he goes to his bedroom, and it sounded like a bull moose was dying back there for the next six months. You never heard anything like it. And I thought, whoa, is he ever going to learn to play this thing or not? Well, through middle school, he got much better. And in high school, he was pretty good, pretty good. Now, Joel, what, the most important thing when he gets to play is to make sure that that reed that he puts in the mouthpiece of that saxophone is right. It cannot be cracked. It's got to be moist. Joe's, before he goes to play, he's standing around sucking on the reed. He wants to get it moist. Puts it back in there just right. If that reed cracks, I don't know of anything that he can do with it other than to throw it away, but he's not going to take a chance, I can tell you that. 
that that reed's going to mess up his plan. And I'll brag a little bit like you would expect most fathers to do. Joel become, became, in his senior year, the number two ranked saxophone player in the state of Virginia. He went to Virginia State Competition and was second chair in the Virginia State uh, Concert, whatever. And now he is a, uh, he's a band director in Sharando High School, um, and that's south of Winchester. So he's good. Joel said about the three boys, he said, Dad, you got to be pleased with us. We're all rowing our own boat. He meant they all had jobs. They're rowing their own boat. I said, yeah, I'm kind of pleased with that. But G Jesus here speaks about a, a bruised reed and a smoking flax. Both things are basically worthless. What are you going to do with a bruised reed? I don't think you're going to glue it back. It's not going to play right. What's anybody going to do with a, blue, a bruised reed? Joel used to buy them by the dozens. He'd buy them in plastic bags. And they weren't cheap. But he's going to make sure he has a, bru a, a, a good reed. Now what about a smoking flax? I, I don't know if, if any of us use smoking flaxes or not. I know they, they make these wax bowls and you drop something down in it and it burns, I think. I don't know if it's called a flax or a wick or a piece of thread, but it works. But a smoking flax is not going to work. I know a little bit about lanterns because up in Mount Storm, when the power would go out, we would break out the oral lanterns. And we had the simple kind that you just turned up the wick, trim it off a little bit, and it burned pretty clean. And then we had the Aladdin lanterns. Now those lanterns didn't have a wick like the others. They had a, a globe in them. Looked like a, a, a stringed uh, netting of some type. And as long as it was together real good, I tell you, that thing would brighten up. It would brighten up a whole room just from that lantern. It's amazing. Now, I, I, absolutely, I never saw one of those globes damaged. So I don't know what you do if it gets damaged. But I know that a, a bad flax or a bad wick in a lantern will smoke the globe of that lantern all up until it won't even give any light. And I would guess an Aladdin lantern could do the same type of things. But you know, Jesus said... He's not going to throw these things away. How does this apply to us? I'm, I'm not going to point fingers at you today. This is not a sermon to put you down. I'm just going to point finger right back at me. I, I'm the broken reed. I'm the smoking flax. When Jesus walked along the seashore or along the paths that he walked in Israel, he didn't say that he was going to throw me away just because I'm cracked. I've got a, a flaw. My read, the read that I am is not going to play right. He's not going to throw me out, quench the fire in my life just because it's smoking. And I'll confess to you, I did a lot of smoking. Now, not, not literally, 
Oh, I smoked marijuana once, but I did not inhale. <laughs> Jesus saw me exactly the way I am. He walked along the shore. He wasn't just looking for the perfect one. He saw all the broken ones. And he saw what could happen in their lives. There's a little teeny one. It's just as perfect as it can be. We all take on the likeness of a bruised reed and the smoking flax. I don't know where you are right now in that picture at all. I wouldn't even begin to speculate. But I know where I've been. And I thank the Lord that in the lowest times of my life, that Jesus didn't say, well, that's it for you. I mean, you, and I'm speaking to myself, you've hit the bottom. <laughs> Think of you could be a preacher. Are you kidding? Look at what you've done in your life. He didn't say that. He didn't say it to me, and he doesn't say it to you. And if you've got cracks, and I don't know what they might look like, maybe your Ford truck won't run like mine. What am I going to do with that Ford truck? Every time I go out there to get in that thing, it won't start. Most of the time, it don't even make a noise when you turn the key. And so Christy's saying, you need to sell that truck. I don't want to sell that truck. That truck is... Well, I don't see why you'd sell it. It's got 160-some thousand miles on it. Why does somebody think it quit now? Run that far? Well, if you just don't hear anything else this morning, please think about the smoking flax and the bruise reed. And if you ever think you might compare to that, you remember what Jesus said about it. A bruised reed he will not cast out. A smoking flax he will not quench. Just commit those two lines to your mind and heart. And let it jump out of your memory anytime and every time you think you're smoking or cracked and remember what Jesus said about it not done with you not done with you yet and you might say oh you don't know about what's in my life well you know what I'd say to you then <laughs> you don't know what's in my life either Jesus knows and he restored it all back to me And let me tell you, read your Bible. A young boy called his mother from college and said, I need more money. I'm sure that happens a lot. She said, okay. And he said, by the way, I left my chemistry book uh, at the house. Would you send it to? Yes. Mother said, I'll do that. So she got his chemistry book and she put $20 check on the front of the book took it to the post office and mailed it she came back home and her husband said well how much money did you mail to our son she said well I taped a $20 check on the front cover and then I leafed inside the chemistry book and got to about chapter 19 and I just deposited a $200 check in there if he just looks at the cover he gets to twenty dollars 
If he reads the inside of the book, he gets $200. Folks, hey, this is a new Bible, by the way. This is the only second time I've preached out of this Bible. Don't judge me by the look of my Bible, okay? Every preacher is supposed to have a worn out Bible. Today I got a brand new one. I paid $15 for it at Ollie's. It's got genuine imitation of imitation cowhide. <laughs> but you know what? It's only worth $15 if you lay it on the coffee table and just leave it lay there. It's worth infinite value. This $15 Bible is worth infinite value when you open it up and read the inside. Make your Bible of infinite worth by reading from it every day. Let me close with prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, I, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here at the Oakdale Church of the Brethren with these um, wonderful brothers and sisters. It is humbling to uh, be in a position to preach the word. And it's only through the Holy Spirit, Lord, that the message can truly be conveyed. It'll never happen through my uh, stumbling, poor uh, West Virginia Smoky Mountain language. But it will happen through the words of the Holy Spirit in the innermost parts of our heart, even today. And I thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.